And so um, hold fire, we'll just wait till the numbers, as I say, um, flatten out and then we'll get started. So just folks let you know, we've got a couple more minutes um, before kickoff. We'll just wait till everyone comes in and takes their virtual seat in our um, conference room uh, and then we'll get going. So uh, we'll just wait till numbers begin to stabilise and, and then we'll kick off. So good evening, everyone, uh, and, and welcome. There's a, still a few more people trickling in, but I think we'll, we'll kick off. Um, my name is Juliet Vickery. I'm the Chief Executive of the British Trust for Ornithology, and it's a huge pleasure to welcome you to join us um, to this, our second virtual AGM, um, for what I know will be an absolutely fantastic talk about a really uh, extraordinary project. Obviously, it's a shame we can't meet face to face again. Um, nothing beats that um, that face to face encounter. But on the plus side, we have over 600 people registered um, for this evening. So we really are able to bring fantastic science and stories to a much wider audience, which clearly wouldn't have been possible um, face to face uh, in Swanwick. But um, I'm sure Swanwick will return before too long. Fingers crossed. Um, and of course, meeting like this means that we can do so uh, without incurring our own costs and travel and, of course, keeping our carbon footprint um, to an absolute minimum. So um, that has to also be seen as a positive. So uh, whether you're welcome, whether you're regular um, or this is your first uh, conference attendance, um, you're, you're very welcome um, to this, our first session. And we do have a fantastic opening session by a brilliant double act of Penny Green and Tony Davis. Um, about a really extraordinary project known as NEP, this project to work with nature and 
really to let nature take its course rather than dictate uh, what should or should not be present um, at a particular site. So before we get to the introduction for that particular talk, a few bits of housekeeping around questions and answers. So um, if you hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen, you will hopefully see a Q&A uh, button, and that's a where to place your questions. Um, so feel free to post questions throughout the talk. Um, if when you're doing that, you see a question there that you think is an interesting one, give it a thumbs up and that will push it to the top of the list. And it means I'll ask the questions that most of you want to know the answers to. Um, so uh, do put questions in um, around this talk as we go along. Uh, and as I say, give a thumbs up to ones that you'd also like to see answered. If you've got any general questions about the BTO, then save that for our AGM on Saturday um, and we will try to answer all of those then. So we do have a lot of uh, fantastic free talks lined up over the course of this week for you. Um, and many of those are really only possible thanks to the support of our BTO members. Um, so almost half of our charitable income comes from donations and gifts from our members. Um, and without your support, we simply wouldn't be what we are today. So a huge thank you um, to all of you for already so generously supporting us. Of course, we're always looking to do more uh, in terms of engagement and science. And so uh, if you're in a position to make anything extra in a way by over donation, um, then the, uh, the link is there on your screen um, to do just that. Um, and again, we would be hugely grateful for anything that you might be able to uh, provide to help us do better for nature, really. Um, if you are a member, then again, thank you so much for supporting us and joining us. Um, if you're not, then, you know, have us in mind and listen to this particular talk and talks the rest of the week uh, and, and uh, maybe think about whether you'd also like to join us uh, in our work. Um, we would welcome any and all of you uh, in, our, in our mission. So let's get on with the first opening talk um, of our virtual AGM. Um, it's entitled Symphonious Spring, Rewilding and Birds and, uh, in the Net Wildland. So many of you have heard about NEP. Some of you may have been lucky enough to actually go there and to join one of the safaris that one of our speaker organizes. But just by a little bit of background, in 2001, the NEP estate started to move from an arable and dairy farmland or, or uh, uh, yeah, farming agricultural concern um, to a really pioneering conservation project. And this began the rewilding of 3,500 acres in Sussex are using natural processes to restore uh, a natural system. So large herbivores moving freely in the landscape to graze and create a mosaic um, of open land and scrub. Um, and uh, literally, as I say, allowing nature to, to determine what uh, is and is not present without us essentially dictating the route uh, of that particular uh, natural habitat. Uh, and our double active speakers um, have been intricately involved in this journey um, for a very long time. Penny Green is NEP's ecologist, and Tony Davis is the lead ringer. And between them, they're going to share this journey, this extraordinary transition, um, and some fantastic results and headline successes um, to date. So a little bit about our speakers before I hand over to them. Tony, despite um, his youthful appearance, has been a, a BTO a member for nearly 29 years. Um, he has been contributing to our NEST record scheme for even longer, um, and um, led many training courses since, the 1980, since 2008. Um, for that nest record scheme. So many people who are part of that scheme will have learned um, their skills from Tony. He, of course, has been applying those skills in surveys, in ringing and in demography um, at NEP for a very long time, and he'll share some of that in a moment. Penny Green is, as I say, NEP's resident ecologist. Um, she manages the NEP safaris team, the volunteers and the research students, um, and she coordinates the biological monitoring of the rewilding project. She studied countryside management at Brinsby College and went on to work with the National Trust, the Sussex Wildlife Trust, and the Sussex Biodiversity Records Centre. So a fantastically experienced and knowledgeable double act um, to kick us off uh, on our first talk. So over to Penny and Tony um, for Symphonia Spring, uh, the Net Rewilding Project. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for having me along to speak this evening, a very prestigious uh, spot on the BTO's calendar. Um, 
as um, Juliet says, I'm the ecologist at NEP. I have this very, very lucky role to be uh, working at NEP uh, amongst a whole load of amazing, enthusiastic naturalists, professional and amateur. And it wouldn't be without them. It, without them, we wouldn't be able to find out half the things that we know about NEP now. So this evening, if I can get the PowerPoint to work. I'm going to talk about the move away from intensive agriculture, the introduction of herbivores, the subsequent rewilding of the land, some of the wildlife successes that we've experienced so far, and I'm going to talk about the bird surveys and some of the bird highlights that we've seen at NEP uh, so far. And then I'm going to pass over to Tony to talk a bit about our ringing uh, that goes on at NEP. So hopefully some of you have visited NEP before. It's a rather wonderful place. So if you've not visited before, I really recommend it, especially in the spring. It's the most amazing place for a dawn chorus or to hear the nightingales. Um, we're just south of Horsham in West Sussex, uh, just north of Worthing. Uh, this is the A24, if you're looking at the map here. Uh, just running up the side of NEP here uh, and so we're not far away from London, we're not far away from Brighton and it's uh, easy to get to uh, site. We're about three and a half thousand acres, uh, so that's about a site that's about seven kilometres long and about three kilometres wide. And we're on a really heavy wheeled clay. Um, and anyone that's read Isabella Tree's book, Wilding, about NEP will know a lot about that because it's talked about a lot in her book. Uh, but really, you know, we've seen every extreme of the weather, especially in the time that I've been at NEP uh, since 2015. Uh, from droughts, uh, drought summers where the, the clay is baked hard with huge cracks appearing all the way through to very wet springs where we're slopping around in the mud up to our knees in, in mud um, it, well into sort of May, June time. So it really is a very unforgiving land, um, especially for growing any kind of arable. Uh, but what turns out to be bad for um, farming turns out to be fantastic for wildlife. And so we have all of these uh, little uh, lags, we call them, these little floodplain meadows that run through the southern block of the estate here. So these little blue veins uh, bringing life to this area. Uh, these are of particular interest for the turtle doves, uh, aquatic plants, aquatic invertebrates and so on, and water shrews. This is the southern block uh, at the bottom of the map here. I'll be referring to that uh, quite a lot in my talk. Uh, and you can see in this area, we have lots of uh, little fields of about 10 acres, most of them about 10 acres or so. And each of these fields has a ditch and a hedgerow around it. So it's wonderful template from where the rewilding project could spring up from all of that seed source, acorns, uh, beech masts, um, berries and, and so on, all contributed to the, the um, emergence of that scrubland uh, uh, subsequent to leaving farming. So this is the southern block and we have a little country lane running across the southern block here uh, that breaks us up from the middle block which is a Repton Park. So this was designed by Humphrey Repton about 220 years ago and it actually goes all the way back to the 11th century as a deer park uh, but during the war that area was dug up uh, in the Dig for Victory campaign and put to farming uh, and was very intensively farmed up until the rewilding project started in 2000-2001. Uh, but we have a beautiful big mill pond here uh, that's got a wet woodland um, that's very good for species like lesser uh, spotted woodpeckers. We've got a heronry uh, and this uh, big body of water here is fantastic for wildfowl, especially in the winter. And then we have the A272 running across uh, the top of uh, the middle block. And then we have the northern block. And this is very Parkland-like. So the middle and uh, middle and northern block are very uh, Parkland-like with big veteran trees, quite open um, and very deer park-like. But we're just starting to see a bit of a tipping point with a scrub in, in those areas. And in the southern block, this is a really wild and woolly area where we have lots of scrub uh, and growing out hedges and wonderful veteran trees. So that's just to set the scene of where we are in the world. Um, and um, it's really seen uh, quite a long history of farming. So the burrows have been at NEP for 220 years and uh, about 100 years or so has seen um, farming there, sort of cattle uh, rearing, arable, uh, champion sheep breeding uh, and that kind of thing going on. And as you can see in the bottom right hand picture here, this is exactly what was happening um, for World War II when there was a dig for victory campaign following an agricultural depression you know, a lot of this marginal uh, land was taken out of production and really wasn't putting back into production until uh, World War II when everyone was doing their bit for the war effort. And from then onwards, when Charlie uh, took over the estate uh, at the age of 21, 
Um, he was fresh out of agricultural college with lots of new knowledge about herbicides, pesticides, pesticides and fertilizers, uh, new machinery and technology that would help you grow um, more crops. Uh, and so he really, uh, you know, intensified the effort to try and make this bit of uh, hard to farm land uh, as profitable as possible. So there was a, um, a herd of 600 dairy cows and about 2000 acres of arable and they carried on farming in that uh, lovely Repton Park. And Repton would have certainly been uh, turning in his grave as um, there was ploughing and harvesting over the roots of his lovely veteran trees that were once an important feature of his um, Repton Park. Um, and as you can see here, the hedges were flailed with an inch of their life every year, and there really wasn't much space for nature at all in this landscape. So um, uh, Charlie and his wife Izzy tried for 20 long years to try and make this land as productive as possible and uh, without success um, with still um, you know, a lot of money needing to be spent on dairy barns and so on and being quite in debt. They thought it was time to do something a bit different and Charlie having grown up in Australia and Africa decided that it would be quite cool to do something with a sort of more free roaming kind of ranched style um, herbivores. And so he was turned on to the idea of rewilding uh, and the fact that it was a sort of a light touch system that could be really good for wildlife. And it's all about long term minimum intervention, natural process led areas. And it's as hands off as possible. And the consequences are you know, a huge spike in biodiversity. And as a result of uh, that wildlife uh, and what's going on there, the land management, you can have um, a lot of um, a harvest, a lot of meat from that land, free roaming, pasture fed and organic meat. That's much better for wildlife wildlife better for the planet and better for the end consumer. So they, uh, about year 2000, 2001, uh, having visited um, a rewilding project in the Netherlands called Aesfardus Plas, and they could see that, you know, these places could be fantastic for wildlife. So they decided to move away from these monocultures at NEP, all of these photos are taken at NEP, and um, move towards a whole new way of land management with free roaming animals that would influence the habitats that emerges that would then go on to be great for wildlife. And so these are our, our big five, our, you know, the, the, the herbivores that are, are driving the system here uh, for us. And all of these animals are proxies for uh, species that would have been in our landscape in the past. Uh, we're not trying to go back to any particular point in time, but what we are trying to do is emulate some of the mouthpieces and disturbance that would have come with these uh, animals, herbivores and pigs and so on, that would have been in our landscape before. So we have a head of 290 uh, old English longhorn cattle divided up into those three areas of the estate and um, they are pretty wild and free roaming uh, they're out all year round and like all of the animals at NEP they're not supplementary fed so they are you know feeding away on um, you know the hedges and in the scrub maybe self-medicating in the willow in the winter and they have to make their own living all year round um, because uh, you know that, that we're not supplementary feeding them and of course they're checked every day to make sure that they're happy and healthy by our stockmen and um, of course a uh, Med, med, um, medical attention is given to any that do need it but generally they're free roaming and doing their own thing and these uh, these cattle are actually here in lieu of the aurochs which is the wild oxen that would have been in our landscape in the past there would have been a much taller bigger more aggressive beast uh, but of course we've got lots of footpaths and bridleways across nep so we've got a nice dose of version of the extinct aurochs and that's this uh, lovely old english longhorn and they're certainly doing the same kind of thing in the landscape the way they're feeding the way they're moving around the way they're depositing seeds and nutrients around in their dung uh, seeds from their fur uh, and their hooves and so on and it's really lovely seeing them uh, out wild at NEP you know they're carving um, and you know feeding and the disturbance that they bring even every down down to the like little niches that are created by when the bulls are in with with the, the herd where they're scuffing away at the ground and hoofing away making these nice little bear patches that uh, for example insects can come and bask on. 
Then we have uh, six breeding Tamworth sows uh, and their piglets, normally about 25 or so piglets every year. And the Tamworth pigs are here in lieu of the wild boar. Uh, so under the Dangerous Wild Animal Act, we're not allowed to reintroduce wild boar without electric fencing. And over these kind of areas, for especially the southern block, uh, that's over a thousand acres, uh, that would be a huge job to maintain. So instead, we've got the Tamworth pig, which is again, less aggressive. They have just one litter a year because we have a boar come in with them over, and runs with them over the winter. And they are really one of the big movers and shakers in the rewilding project. They're a keystone species. So they're rootling that you can see in the picture there where they're turning over uh, the soil and the turf. Uh, they're creating all sorts of opportunities for arable weeds to get growing, for the willow to, to get growing and for insects to come and bask and uh, bury down into to the soil to make nests and so on. So uh, they're, they're a wonderful ambassador for the project and people love coming to see these lovely lovely ginger Tamworth pigs at NEP. Uh, then we have the red deer and they're not here in lieu of anyone they are here as themselves they've been in our landscape for, for uh, a long time indeed um, and they uh, have two herds one in the middle block and one in the southern block and overall about 100 or so of them uh, including some wonderful uh, big stags and they've just had their rut and uh, again sort of during this time they're creating all sorts of disturbance where they're scraping their antlers on trees uh, and they were really brought in as a heavy hit to, to ring bark some of the younger trees that are coming through so punching back against uh, the succession in some areas of the southern block especially uh, they're ring barking and killing off uh, young sallow for example and creating lots of interesting deadwood habitat there uh, we have the Exmoor ponies in lieu of the tarpan. And if you look back at cave paintings from about 17,000 years ago, you'll see uh, the tarpan, the cave paintings of tarpan that look very similar indeed to the Exmoor pony. And genetically, they're one of the closest relatives of the tarpan. And they're doing exactly the same kind of job as the tarpan would have done in our landscape. So they're, you know, again, creating disturbance. They're feeding on all sorts of different uh, vegetation, nibbling away on thistle flowers, eating hazelnuts in the woodland, uh, eating hawthorn and roots and obviously grazing as well so they're uh, creating all sorts of interesting um, opportunities there for other wildlife and potentially because they're eating the sort of the lower down vegetation they're following the, the longhorn cattle around that are eating the longer vegetation and creating the opportunities for the exmoor ponies to be able to feed so we have two herds one's a breeding herd in the middle block and a non-breeding herd in the southern block because there's a lot of bridleways and amorous stallions don't mix too well with bridleways and then uh, we have the fallow deer. We have over 400 uh, fallow deer between the middle and the southern block. Um, and we're just having a huge cull of them at the moment to bring their numbers right back down again, almost emulating a pandemic style um, effect. And um, the fallow deer um, were introduced this uh, interglacial period by the Normans, but we, they would have been here naturally in previous interglacial periods uh, in a sort of a slightly larger versions of the current fallow deer that we have. Um, so they are, again, sort of themselves in our landscape and they're grazing and also browsing like some of the other animals as well. So they're not just eating grass, but they're eating woody stuff, sort of leaves, twigs, branches, a bit of bark, that kind of thing. And... Um, what all of these animals are doing uh, are providing the disturbance and the, the way that they're feeding. They've all got different mouth parts that feed in different ways. And uh, these are, are the processes that lead to it being a process led project. So a lot of nature reserves, not all, but a lot of nature reserves are very target led. You'll have very specific management plans in mind, management techniques that you know are going to result in a, a specific suite of species turning up. So if you're managing heathland or coppice woodland or a, a hay meadow, for example, you know exactly what you need to do to create the kind of conditions for certain species to turn up and when those species turn up you know you're hitting your targets and you're getting your management just right and NEP we're able to be a, a bit more process led so it's the processes that are driven by having these herbivores there uh, and the movement uh, the way they move around in the landscape the way they feed and so on all contributes to this process led approach and from this we don't really know what we're going to see uh, turning up at NEP and what kind of way the habitat's going. So it's a really interesting way, uh, and especially on a landscape scale, that we can um, sort of have a bit of an experiment in a way to see how we can link up existing nature reserves and other valuable wildlife sites with this a slightly more uh, sort of a free and easy approach to conservation.
So what we're seeing so far is um, a, a you know massive move away from arable to the beginnings of a kind of new age wood pasture system. And as you can see in this photo here, there's a, a lot of scrub, and um, th this thorny scrub is providing amazing natural uh, uh, tree guards for some of the tree saplings that are emerging from this area. So none of it's planted in the southern block. It's all sort of naturally occurring, natural recolonization or regeneration. And so these oak saplings, as they grow, are uh, protected by the thorny scrub, so wild rose, hawthorn, blackthorn and bramble, uh, and as those trees get growing, uh, they've got that protection and eventually those, those oak saplings will shade out that scrub underneath it and uh, it go on to be an open grown um, tree. And we're finding all sorts of interesting trees emerging, including uh, wild service trees, ash, uh, field maples, oaks and sallow coming up in these areas with that protection from the thorn. And here's a before and after um, video um, to show how it's changing over the years. Um, and uh, you can see the scrub is really getting going there. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about the scrub later on and how uh, much new vegetation we've got. But also we have assisted some um, elements of the rewilding project by kind of resetting the scene. Uh, for example, digging uh, big scrapes like the one in, in this uh, little video here. And this is providing a, you know, a whole new uh, different opportunity for, for other wildlife as well. And so across the estate, we've got lots of different habitat types that are contributing to different kinds of wildlife. We've got dung with no ivermectins or pesticides in it. Uh, we've got ancient trees, we've got wet woodland, we've got open water, streams, lags, hedgerows, and a lovely uh, two and a half kilometre long river restoration. And that's providing all sorts of wonderful opportunities for wildlife. So these hedgerows that I mentioned earlier on that were once, uh, you know, flailed with an inch of their life are now these beautiful billowing out hedges that are just wonderful for all sorts of uh, species. Uh, uh, from a bird's point of view, it's, you know, fantastic nesting opportunities for birds, in particular the nightingale, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on. The veteran trees provide opportunities for thousands of different species um, and in particular bats we're finding uh, we've got uh, good populations of different bats at NEP including Barbersdales and Becksteins that will be relying on this kind of habitat. Uh, the lovely little floodplain meadows or lags as we call them locally, uh, fantastic watering holes for um, some of the herbivores and the pigs, uh, but wonderful for dragonflies, um, you know, all sorts of other aquatic uh, plants and invertebrates thriving in these areas. The scrapes provide a nice opportunity for the red deer that really love coming to wallow in these areas, as do the pigs. Uh, we've got little grebes nesting here and again, wonderful for species of dragonfly, such as the scarce chaser that we have in great numbers here at NEP. And the scrubland itself um, provides a wonderful sequence of nectar sources through the spring and the summer, all the way from the sallow being in flower in March, then you're on to the blackthorn blossom, then the hawthorn, then the bramble, the wild rose, and then we go into ragwort and fleabane. So really, we've got, you know, uh, nectar sources from March all the way through to sort of October, November time. And it really is, you know, humming with invertebrates, and that can only be good for other species such as bats and birds. So some of the research that we have carried out at NEP, um, you know, we've got all sorts of wonderful wildlife surveys going on. But one of the big missing um, surveys that wasn't done at the beginning of the project uh, was actually looking at our soil. So no soil samples were taken. But luckily, we have a neighbouring farmed um, bit of landscape that was actually uh, purchased from NEP that we're able to uh, compare because they've carried on farming there and comparing to this farmer we found we've actually got double the amount of organic carbon in the soil already and that was in just 15 years we've got double the amount of microbial biomass so that's all your bacteria and goodies that make a functioning um, soil um, ecosystem and an increase in fungal biomarkers and this is you know great news for us you know it's, it's a recovering uh, soil ecosystem but this goes to show that actually farmed land can make a recovery and it can bounce back pretty quickly so if we wanted to have pulses of rewilding across our landscape to help replenish our soils on uh, intensively farmed areas that this could be something uh, we could do in the future. 
We've been working with Queen Mary University of London to quantify uh, the vegetation change at NEP using LIDAR, which is laser scanning technology. Uh, so from this data, we've been able to uh, see that we've gained 1.3 million square meters of scrub since the beginning of the project in 2000. And so that means for every three square meters uh, that was farmland before, more than one square meter is now scrub, which I think is pretty remarkable. And you have to think of that in terms of uh, bird life. That's a lot of nesting habitat, a lot of places where you can find insect and berry uh, food sources and fantastic roost, uh, uh, roost sites as well for wintering thrushes and so on. And we're also hoping that as time goes on, we'll be able to work out how much carbon has been sequestered uh, in the scrub itself from, from this LIDAR data as well. And that's an ongoing project with Queen Mary. And of course, a lot of the uh, data collection that we're doing at NEP couldn't happen without the help of a lot of amateur naturalists and their enthusiasm and knowledge is amazing and we couldn't do it without them. So we've got this big bubbling pot of data that these guys are all contributing to. Uh, and um, what we have at NEP, because we don't have the targets as such, we have something we call emerging or emergent properties. So there are things that are coming out of the project that we could never have hoped or dreamed of, we haven't planned for. But what we do is we do lots of monitoring uh, so we can keep a tab on what is happening with the way that the habitat is changing, but also which species are turning up. And so far, far we've actually recorded uh, 30,000 records of over 3,000 species. And this is going to go up over this winter when I do a lot more data entry. It's my winter job. 85 nationally notable and scarce species have been recorded at NEP. We've got 13 of the 18 resident bat species recorded at NEP. And uh, since um, doing um, some bat surveys, we found that we've got uh, an amazing number of female bats now at NEP along the river restoration project where we didn't have them before. And this is a good sign that the river restoration is providing optimum foraging habitat for these bats uh, when they're breeding on site, which is very exciting. We've recorded over 1,800 different invertebrate species and uh, counting, uh, and over 30 red list birds uh, have been recorded at NEP as well. And that's, uh, you know, we're, we're using the, the ringing, the nest recording, and the different bird surveys that we're running to, to help evaluate what's going on with these, these special, special species. So I do lots of structured surveys at NEP, uh, which we're constantly revisiting baseline surveys and baselines are very important when you're setting up rewilding projects. You need to get them going well before the rewilding starts so that you can see the, the dramatic changes that go on. Um, and some of these, you know, we'll be doing annually, others will be doing every five or 10 years, depending on how intensive they are. Uh, some uh, surveys, you know, when I started in 2015, I realised there are huge gaps in the surveys and a lot of that's to do with resources that are available at the time and not really knowing what was going to happen. So since I've started, I've set up some more baseline surveys and I never think, I think it's never too late to, to set up new baselines because you never know what you might be able to record uh, going forward. And we're turning into a bit of a regional and national hotspot uh, for a variety of different species. Some of these I'm going to talk about in a moment separately anyway. But I wanted to highlight um, the violet door beetle in the top right hand corner there, Geotrupes mutator. So this is a fantastic, a huge dung beetle uh, that hadn't been recorded in Sussex for over 50 years. And we found it in good numbers at NEP. And this could be to do with the fact that we've got no ivermectins going routinely into our cattle. So the dung pats are, you know, really sort of top quality uh, you know full of insects and uh, insect life and that goes on to be good for all sorts of other species like bats and birds we've got uh, the largest site in the UK uh, that we know of uh, for purple emperors with a peak count a couple of years ago of 388 on uh, in a day which is just remarkable and we think we've got also the largest site in in the UK for brown hair street butterfly as well and we monitor these by uh, looking for their eggs uh, at this time of year just after all the leaves have come off of the blackthorn and of course we've got lots of blackthorn uh, and that's why we're seeing lots of brown hair streak the purple emperor are thriving on um, the, the sallow growth uh, that we've got there as well 
uh, we get all sorts of wonderful records coming in from volunteers and uh, visitors, uh, great white egrets. We have up to a dozen or so over the winter uh, roosting along the mill pond. I've even seen a couple um, sort of during the summer months and I think probably not too long before we start seeing them breeding, I hope. And we've also had a couple of black stork sightings like in the bottom right hand corner there uh, whizzing over the mill pond. And unfortunately I missed it. Um, and I think it flew over Tony's head as well when he was looking it down at some flies. <laughs> rather than up at the skies so uh, we're also you know delighted to have recorded a couple of golden oriole uh, nep last year hoo poo um, but also uh, one of the white-tailed eagles from the isle of wight reintroduction project uh, flew over uh, this summer as well which was so exciting but we just missed it only one person got to see it i think um, and other people kind of ran outside and we unfortunately missed it but we have a whole suite of other wonderful um birds of prey at nep including breeding hobby breeding peregrine buzzards red kites ravens all breeding on site, sparrowhawks, kestrels, uh, barn owls, uh, long-eared owls, you name it. Um, so it's, you know, it's a really special place for all sorts of different birds. We have lots of structured surveys of our birds. Um, I was inspired by the RSPB's uh, drone surveys of their great white egret nests. Uh, so I thought, um, you know, we we were under recording the heron nest in the heronry on the mill pond and we could see from uh, the rowing boat that it was a lot more than we could actually get to to, to uh, record so I tried out my uh, terrible drone flying skills and they've got much better over the last few years I'm pleased to say and from this we can actually look at the productivity of the nests so we can see you know eggs I think you can see sort of in the on the um, left hand side left hand picture there you can see there's an egg in that nest sometimes you'll see three or four eggs um, you can see young in the left hand nest there and you can obviously see the adults sitting on the nest and the guano really helps uh, the, the nest to show up especially early on in the year before the foliage comes out and this has given us a much better idea of how many nests we've got and we've actually got five times more nests than we thought we had so I think we've got about 30 to 35 nests most year and as you, you can see there there's um, three quite well grown young sitting in that nest probably not far off fledging so that's a really interesting way of embracing technology to help us with recording. Um, so we've been doing breeding bird surveys at NEP since 2005, so quite near the beginning of the project. And um, I, as I said, I started in 2015. And a couple of years later, I realised um, with the help of Ken and Linda Smith that um, these this bird transect wasn't really showing us anything. It wasn't really representative of what was happening in the, the rewilding project itself in the scrubland in the Southern Block. Uh, you can see the old transect here is um, uh, following the, the route of a bridleway, like a green lane. that has got very sort of stable habitat either side of it, of sort of like a, an old hedge line and sort of some quite tall um, old trees. So you weren't really getting an idea of what's happening on, it, on the actual scrubland itself. So we thought it would be um, really interesting experiment so to, in 2018 to compare this transect up the bridleway uh, to a new route that actually walks all the way through the scrub and you're immersing yourself in the scrub uh, with birds singing either side of you and you're going to really see the changes happen over the years. So um, we tried that. It's a, it's a longer transect admittedly but we got really good results. So we used uh, white throat as a good uh, uh, comparison species because um, we could see there's a lot of them at NEP. Uh, so on the original transect we recorded uh, just three singing males on that two kilometre transect but on the new zigzagging uh, transect that goes through the scrub uh, in the same year uh, we recorded 44 singing males so that's giving us a much bigger sample size that's going to show change over a longer time so what I've done is used uh, our stockman's tracks so where our stockman checks the cattle every day I know that those tracks are going to stay open so I'll be able to get between the scrub in the future and uh, going forward that should give us a much better data set so that's one thing I've learned um, sort of, you know, that even though you've spent a lot of money and time on uh, bird surveys up until that point, so 13 years of bird surveys, it's not showing us anything. So we may as well move on uh, and try something different. So that's what we did there. And I'm really pleased that we made that move because we're going to start seeing some interesting trends coming out of that data. And also it's a, sort of a completely a breeding bird surveys, whereas before it's kind of like a hybrid between common bird census and the breeding bird survey. So it wasn't really comparable to, to national trends. And then in 2019, Tony Davis uh, 
in his wisdom decided it would be great for us to do a common bird census at NEP uh, and we all went yeah yeah that sounds great so there's a team of us that went out and I think within about half an hour of our first survey we realized what a mammoth task we'd taken on so common bird census for those of you that don't know is where you go out and you try to map every territory in an area we were covering about a thousand acres in the southern block so that's a lot of birds um, and a, a lot of ground to cover uh, and it was a, it was a sort of a short version of CBC so we did it over four visits rather than the standard 10 visits but we thought it would give us a really good idea of uh, that give us a snapshot in time of what's happening in the southern block within that amount of birds because of that scrub you know and it's a perfect age at the moment it's kept in the kind of um sort of uh sort of a status quo in a way by the the, the nibbling uh, way of the, the herbivores they're keeping a lot of that scrub nice and tight and sh uh, sort of fairly low down in most places so we know that that bird habitat is going to be good for quite a bit longer so for example we've got a uh, white throat territory here again a nice go-to species and um, you can see uh, this is all of um, Tony's hard work pulling uh, all these territory uh, data together and Josie Hewitt thank you very much to you for, for putting all of this into maps for us to look at today uh, lots of hard work has gone into getting it to this point and it's actually amazing we had over 250 uh, white throat territories in in the southern block there and that's a lot of white throat so you can imagine when you're out there at dawn you know you can hear several white throats around you and there's only so much your brain can take with white throats <laughs> you, you after a while it's kind of one two three four many you just can't get a, a good grasp. I'm sure we must have underestimated how many white throats we have because there's so many of them. And um, going back to that Queen Mary data set using the LIDAR data, you know, this was really fascinating that we've, we've been able to do this. So we've overlaid the territories uh, of the white throat onto that LIDAR data. And that LIDAR data was able to show us um, the different kinds of scrub. Um, so we've got the thorny scrub in yellow, the sallow scrubs, that's kind of willow that we have at NEP in orange and the bramble scrub in, in the purpley, sorry, the pinky red kind of color there. And so you can see if we zoom in, uh, the kind of habitat that the white throats go for and actually most of the other warblers that we get at NEP will be targeting sort of the more scattered rather than dense scrub and normally sort of in the thorny stuff bordering the brambles so that's the kind of habitat that they're aiming for so being able to overlay this data is really really interesting and I'm sure we've got much more delving to do because we've only just you know been doing this over the last week or so uh, that's how long it's taken it's taken two years of uh, data crunching to get to this point and the BTO conference was a good spur to get it finished. Uh, just to show you something, we've got lesser white throats, uh, you know, really, you know, fantastic amount of lesser white throats, 57 territories. And again, that's probably under recorded as well, over four visits. I'm sure we probably have more than that. And they're going for a very similar age structure to the white throat. Again, we could be doing some more delving when we look at height data as well uh, in, in the future. Chiff Chaff seem to be doing very well, um, 232 territories. So they're like, liking the, the hedges and the big old trees that they can sing from. And then they're nesting down on sort of the open pasture areas between the scrub and on the edge of the scrub, um, you know, down on the ground. So they, they're doing pretty well. Interestingly, we only have maybe one or two willow warbler territories. They're just not a big thing at NEP, but Chiff Chaff certainly go for it, uh, as you can see on that map. Um, black caps, 161 territories, again, sort of very similar sort of hedges and into the bramble and thorny scrub there as well. Um, more around the edges of the fields, uh, as you can see on, on this map. And the last one is Dunnock with 204 territories. And there is a lot of Dunnocks, especially sort of normally off during our first CBC visit when we pick up a lot of Dunnocks early on in the season. Uh, so again, they're, they're really enjoying the, the growing out hedges and, and the bramble scrub. And Dunnocks leads me very nicely on to cuckoos. Um, so we have a pretty good number for cuckoos uh, uh, for, uh, on a Sussex basis anyway. So we probably have an estimate of about five or six uh, male cuckoos um, around the NEP area. Um, and um, we're pretty sure they're specialising in Dunnocks. You can see uh, Dunnock on the left, although it doesn't look very Dunnock like that. Definitely was a Dunnock feeding a fledged uh, cuckoo there. Um, and we do a bit of nesting on the reed warbler nests around the hammer pond, and we've not found any cuckoo eggs yet. So we feel that, you know, of all the species that we have at NEP, they're probably uh, focusing on the Dunnocks because they're so abundant. 
And about three or four years ago, um, uh, Chris Hewson and Lee Barber came down from the BTO uh, to catch some cuckoos as part of the cuckoo satellite tagging project. We had really good fun out in the field of them. Uh, there's Chris with his uh, stuffed female cuckoo, uh, and she was using a triangle of nets with a load of different cuckoo calls going on, uh, like a cuckoo orgy happening, uh, attracted cuckoos very quickly into the nets. We, we caught four uh, cuckoos in total, three of which were male, uh, so we could put satellite tags on uh, those because they're slightly larger bird and you can see in the picture of Lee there the little satellite tag sitting on the cuckoo's back like a rucksack. Uh, so three males named Nep, uh, Raymond and um, Lambert, family names, uh, got uh, their satellite tags and were able to follow their progress as they migrated south uh, sort of during the spring and autumn and uh, they successfully came back to NEP the following year. We could even see one of them flying around with his little antennae sticking out, which is great fun. So sort of live in the field, we could sort of see on the app where they were and um, sort of on their website and also sort of where uh, we could actually see the antennae as well. Uh, and then that the following um, sort of spring, uh, sort of summer rather, uh, unfortunately, all three of them um, died on their migration back down to Africa. And, you know, this is one of the reasons the BTO is so key on doing the satellite tagging to learn a lot more about the cuckoo and why they're in such a huge decline so we're really proud to be part of that uh, recording effort and um, we've got lots more cuckoos if you want to come back to, to satellite tag some more you'd be very welcome and so we have um, a couple of real jewels in our crown at NEP, and one of those is the nightingale so the nightingale as we all know is a red list bird and um, uh, the state of Britain's birds report brought out by the BTO last year shows that it's seen a 92% decline in just 48 years, uh, which is a huge decline. Um, but we're really delighted that we're bucking the trend year on year. We're getting more and more uh, singing males turning up at NEP. Um, and um, that is just in the southern block. So overall across the whole estate, we have about 40 singing males this year in the new regenerative farm project that we've got running alongside the rewilding project and around the, the village itself. And um, as um, the, the BTO report says, they've seen an 11% decline in 10 years. So hopefully we're doing our bit to help buck the trend there. And Tony's going to talk a bit more about them and what we're learning about their movements from the ringing that we do at NEP. Um, but I just wanted to talk about the kind of habitat we're finding them in. So these lovely sort of growing out hedges that are billowing out into the fields around them are really providing a, a, a you know, great opportunity for them to nest. So um, they nest right down on the ground, pretty much on the ground or just, you know, just a few centimetres above the ground, normally in a bit of bramble or nettle. Um, and they'll be spending a lot of time in the hedge uh, sort of picking around in the leaf litter looking for insects and we do see them a bit more out in the open when they're starting to feed their, their young in the nest and they're a bit more um, visible then but you know it's a wonderful place to be at night time in the spring I do urge you if you've not heard nightingales before to come down to NEP and have a wander around at night it is a, a, the most amazing experience to hear so many nightingales around you. So the longhorn cattle Again, because they're not being supplementary fed, are feeding away in those hedges, uh, keeping them in check a bit, but letting them billow out a bit because we've got very low stocking density. So it's kind of holding them in a nice sort of kind of condition for nightingales at the moment. And then in the spring, when the, uh, the cows are uh, replenishing their iron uh, supplies after uh, having given birth, you know, they're nibbling away on their nettles along the base of the, the, the hedges, there, hope, helping to keep that quite tight as well. So we think this is providing quite a good uh, habitat for the nightingale. And again, no pesticides anymore, which means that there's an abundance of insects on which these uh, wonderful birds are able to feed themselves and their young in the, the hedges and the bushes. And so Tony is uh, one of the uh, leading nightingale nest finders in the country. So I've, I've watched him at work a few times and it's a great thing if you sit there for quite a few hours waiting to, to find a nightingale nest. So it's not something you can do quickly. But uh, we are finding them in sort of brambly patches and mostly along hedges where they're growing out. But we're just starting to see them uh, coming into a sort of standalone bushes uh, away from hedges as well. And there's plenty of that kind of habitat. So I imagine as time goes on, we'll start seeing uh, hopefully an increase in nightingales returning uh, to NEP. And here's a little nest that uh, Tony found 
in this uh, bush in, in that picture behind there we're able to take them out carefully and ring them and that adds to our um, ringing uh, sort of efforts for the nightingale which is a bit of a, a, a ongoing project for us to look at what happens with nightingales long term and uh, now on to turtle doves, you, you know, they're a very, very special bird. And I feel so lucky to be able to hear these when I'm out doing bird surveys early in the morning. You know, there's not many people that can, you know, uh, you know, have that opportunity to hear them on a regular basis. So I do feel very fortunate. They've seen a huge decline, even more than the nightingale. So they've seen a 98% decline in 48 years. Um, but this year we had, I've got to sort of tot it up properly, but it was roughly about 20 singing males at NEP. Uh, they're quite hard to pin down their territory, so it's always an estimate, uh, but they are doing particularly well. Uh, around those lags, uh, around those little floodplain meadows where you've got a bit of thorny scrub that's emerging, you've got the water and um, arable weeds coming through as well. These guys have seen an 82% decline in 10 years. I mean, that's a huge drop off and um, we hope again what we're learning at NEP we can share with others uh, and um, you know share you know the, the good things that we can learn about them in the hope that we could stop them going extinct as a breeding bird in the UK. So the turtle doves they're loving the growing out uh, hedges and thickets they'll be nesting in this kind of habitat in hawthorn and blackthorn they love having the, the big sort of um, standard trees and other willows and that kind of thing in those hedges to, to perch and sing from um, they uh, are normally centralised around the lags and these little um, streams and so on where they can dip down and uh, get some water to help them digest the seed, but also to, to help them produce the nutritious uh, uh, crop milk that they feed to their young within the first few days of hatching. Um, and we think at the moment, we're just guessing, um, but we would love to be able to prove it one way or the other, that the pigs could be providing an opportunity for the turtle doves to be able to feed. So where the pigs are rootling, they're stirring up the seed bed, they're allowing little arable weeds to get established. So you've got vetches and trefoils, scarlet pimpernel and clovers coming up. And it's the tiny seeds from these plants that the turtle doves feed on. And as you can see in the photo here, the turtle dove has quite short legs. So these little roots in where the pigs have rootled will be giving it opportunities to be able to get in to feed on those little wildflower seeds. And also to um, be able to have this very close to the nest site will mean that they don't have to fly as fox they can fly about 11 or 12 kilometers to have to find food in our landscape these days but if they've got that next to their nest site that's even better so there's less time away from the nest and less time open to predation whilst it's flying but also it has to be within about 200 meters or so of the nest site because that's where um, the the fledged young will be feeding within the first couple of weeks of fledging the nest as well so having all of these things the water the seed source the trees and the wall you know all the all of these things together um, you know could be the critical thing that's missing in our wider landscape um, so we'd love to do a bit more to find out um, about why turtle doves are doing so well at NEP. So we've had uh, various attempts at actually trying to catch turtle doves uh, by luring them down to seed, uh, we've tried uh, dummy whoosh nets and um, uh, these other sort of uh, walk-in traps as well, stock doves coming down, you can see a turtle dove in the background there, we use decoy birds as well to lure them in with grit and water, trying to get them in on a regular basis so we can try and catch them to put radio tags on in the hope that with those radio tags we could work out where they're spending their time, whether it's at NEP or nearby on some of the lovely farmland that surrounds NEP uh, to work out where they're feeding so we can learn a bit more about it. And luckily we've got um, Ken Smith, uh, luckily for me, moved back to Sussex a few years ago with his wife Linda and they've been so supportive through this project. And Ken's love of um, uh, birds and also flying remote control planes, it's meant he was able to construct head the turtle dove uh, with his fanning tail and flapping wings uh, in a way that we could perhaps have this as a like a decoy to lure in uh, turtle doves in order to be able to catch them but alas even this convincing <laughs> convincing radio controlled bird wasn't enough to to fool the, the turtle doves at NEP so we still haven't been able to catch any to put radio tags on but it's an ongoing effort and I'm hoping one day we'll be able to catch them to put radio tags on and find out a bit more about what they're up to and where they're feeding at NEP. So uh, Ken and Linda instigated a turtle dove survey across Sussex um, in 2019 uh, and there was an estimate of 80 turtle dove territories across the whole county um, and we know we have about 20 to 25 
depending on the year at NEP. So I think we can safely say that we hold, we're holding about a quarter of Sussex's turtle doves just at NEP. So we really are a stronghold in the landscape here. So something to, to be proud of and to learn from as well. Uh, I wanted to mention about the stork project, the white stork project uh, that's based at NEP and a couple of other uh, release sites uh, in East Sussex and Surrey. Uh, this is a project that's been going on since 2016 and um, from these three release sites um, it's a big partnership project with private landowners and um, some other organisations I'll talk about in a minute. We aim to restore a population of at least 50 breeding pairs of white stork in southern England by 2030. Uh, the White Stalk Project is uh, supported by uh, loads of amazing partners, including Wintershall in uh, Surrey that has a pen and Wardhurst Park in East Sussex that also has a pen. Durrell Conservation Trust heads up the project and uh, provides a, uh, the project officer. Uh, Cotswold Wildlife Park um, actually breeds and rears uh, young birds for the project as well. And the Warsaw Zoo provides rehabilitated birds for the project and Roy Dennis a Wildlife Foundation provides advice to the project as well. And the idea behind this, uh, the main driver of this project is to get people excited about big wildlife, uh, because as we all know from seeing white storks abroad, um, you know, they live uh, lo um, alongside humans, alongside people in villages and towns, and they're an omen of good luck, of bringing babies and hope. Uh, and this is really what we wanted to highlight, you know, getting people excited about big nature again, living alongside them, and to get people thinking about what these birds need in our wider landscape to be able to, to exist. So um, we uh, are really delighted that, um, you know, we started the project in 2016 with rehabilitated birds coming from Warsaw Zoo. Uh, some of them have hit power lines or fallen out the nest as young, so they won't ever be able to fly again. They might have had a wing amputated or lost an eye, for example, and they are in sort of like an open top pen. Uh, but we also have healthy birds that have recovered and are free flying and they can drop in and out of the pen and get the food if they need it. Uh, but the idea is that having this critical mass of uh, white stalks provides a hub. Uh, it provides a sort of a, a tipping point uh, that instigates uh, a breeding colony. So obviously we have white stalk that visit the UK every year anyway, uh, but the idea is that this uh, instigates a breeding colony. So in 2019, we had one nest uh, that uh, had three eggs unsuccessfully hatched. So that was a good first try run. Uh, and then last year, we had two nests that successfully fledged four young. And this year, we were absolutely delighted that we had seven nests in total, six of which were in oak trees and one actually on Isabella trees chimney of her study so she had to stop reusing her log burner last spring and it's probably quite chilly in there today in this cold wind <laughs> um, because there's a big stork nest on the top um, you can see a little uh, chick uh, chick's head uh, sticking at the top of that nest there and so this year out, out of the seven nests six were successful and 14 young successfully fledged um, and again my drone sky flying skills have come into play again uh, getting better every year and we can look at doing nest record cards uh, to look at how many eggs were laid, how many young hatch, and actually how many go on to successfully fledge the nests. So there's uh, some nice photos there. Um, we have a, a great a tree climber, that's Jeremy Gates, who's a, a tree surgeon, but also a bird ringer himself. So he comes and helps um, get the chicks out of the nest, just at a critical point between their legs being fully formed, uh, but before they get a bit too jumpy. So there's like about a week's window where we can safely go up and we lower them down in the IKEA bags, which allows us to ring the birds. Um, and on those, uh, we are putting a BTO metal ring and also a coloured Darvik ring with a unique number on it so that bird watchers and members of the public can spot those and report those birds uh, when out and about and this helps us uh, you know see where the birds are going at different times of the year um, and uh, which habitats they're utilizing so we've also uh, got uh, GPS trackers on some of the birds. So Cotswold Wildlife Park every year rears a lot of birds for us um, and they bring uh, about 20, uh, 25 birds down a year, just about a week before they fledge the nest. So they feel like they're fledging from nests, so it's their natal site. So we're hoping that once they've migrated, uh, so that's the other prong to the project, so you've got the stable uh, 
population that's here all year round uh, in, in the pen and around the pen. But then you've got the young birds from the nests and from the Cotswold Wildlife Park that are migratory and uh, we're hoping will come back to NEP after two or three years to breed. Uh, some of them have got GPS trackers on, one of which is Marge. Um, after Marge, uh, st stalk margarine. <laughs> and you can see on the map there, her routes down to uh, Morocco and uh, where she's been spending a bit of time. And so she's come back up uh, into Europe and then crosses back down into Morocco again and then started making her way back up uh, through France uh, this spring. And she's on course for coming back to NEP this spring. But just at the last moment, um, she shot off uh, west um, of Dijon uh, because the wind direction changed so she's very fickle uh, <laughs> but we're hoping we might see her coming back uh, to NEP uh, next year and the satellite tagging project is in conjunction with UEA that have been doing uh, a very similar project in Portugal uh, so um, yeah that's a very exciting thing to, to be watching and a lot more of this can be found out on the White Stalk Project website page and the main reason why we have, th have this project is all about people engagement. And last year, um, in a combination of uh, people coming out of lockdown and the stalks being on spring watch, resulted in 50,000 people uh, descending on NEP uh, to, to come see the stalks. And it delighted so many people and uh, young people who came to see that and just loved seeing these uh, charismatic birds back in our skies again. And just to end up really, um, you know, we uh, have got, obviously got the, the Storks as a reintroduction project that's um, being successful so far. And we're currently looking at uh, Redback Shrike as a possible reintroduction project. Um, so we're working with Natural England and the RSPB uh, to, uh, we're halfway through doing a feasibility study. And we know this is a, a, a project that shouldn't be taken lightly. There's a lot of uh, things against it. It would be carried out, uh, the whole project would be carried out using IUCN guidelines. And we know at the moment there's very few, if any, successful migrant passerine reintroductions. <laughs> uh, so this would be a huge undertaking to, to reintroduce a, a, a migrant passerine. And we know that they have a very low return rate. And also that it's not just about NEP. This would be uh, NEP being a core uh, reintroduction site for breeding and release, but we'd need to be looking on a much larger landscape scale to make sure the right kind of habitat's in place to be able to receive returning um, young in, in uh, future years. But we do know on a positive side that captive breeding is very viable. And um, uh, if the project helps create more habitat uh, for this kind of bird around the NEP area, we know that it will benefit other declining species, such as nightingales and turtle doves and other farm and birds that would do well in that kind of scrubland habitat. So we're currently working um, with a sort of a landscape scale project called the Wild to Waves Corridor Project, which is linking NEP down to Climping Gap on the Sussex coast and up to Ashdown Forest uh, inland, uh, working with landowners uh, to uh, you know, link up and make this a more permeable landscape for wildlife anyway. Uh, but also we have a regenerative farm that's just started this year with mob grazing and it's all about soil uh, recovery and hedges being allowed to grow out and for, for birds, bats and pollinators to, to come back to uh, a landscape that was um, devoid of them. And also part of the Upper Ada Farmer Group as well, working with other farmers in the area of about 30 or 40 different landowners and farmers to make sure that you know we've got some uh, fantastic opportunity for wildlife in and around the NEP area. So wildlife uh, that's doing well at NEP can spin out into other areas. So thank you very much for listening. It's a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but I do hope that you can come and visit NEP if you've not visited before. There's loads of footpaths and bridleways that you can come and walk on. Uh, we have a safari business and a campsite, so it's a fun place to come and stay. I do urge you to come and visit and experience the dawn chorus. It's like nothing I've heard before, and I've done a lot of bird surveys, and it's a very special place. It gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. Um, and thank you to the following people for um, all their support and for the content uh, of this talk. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm going to pass over to Tony in a moment, but if you uh, have enjoyed this evening's presentation, do check out our 
podcast, the Net Wildland podcast, where I hang out with people out in the field that are doing um, cool projects and surveys. Uh, it's much more fun than reading a report to actually go out and uh, have that enthusiasm of um, that, that person with you. And the first episode is me and Tony talking about Nightingale. So it's lovely and lots of Nightingale song to get you through the winter months. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. And I will pass over to Tony to uh, talk about the ringing side of things. Right, thanks very much, uh, Penn. Um, right, okay, as Penn's got so much to talk to, this is a bit of a, a whistle stop. Um, but just wanted to tell you a little bit about the ringing that we do at NEP and, and what we're uh, finding out from that. So we, we started ringing in um, autumn of 2015 after Penn became the ecologist at, at NEP. Um, and since then, we have ringed just shy of 10,000 birds, um, of which almost 3,000 are, are black caps. Um, most... Tony, Tony, we're not seeing your slides at the moment. Did you want to, to share slides at this point? Or... Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, sorry. It, uh, it didn't work what was supposed to work then. Uh... Is that, is that any better? Yeah, we're up to the totals 2015 to 2021 then. Right, okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, uh, so we've, we've ringed almost 10,000 birds, of which almost 3,000 are black caps. Um, perhaps the other most notable feature is, is we're... We must be one of very few sites in the country where we ring more or less white throats than great tits. Um, one of the questions that I get asked most frequently is what rarities have you caught? Um, the answer is none. Um, but that's uh, that's really not what we're about and what we're trying to achieve. If you if you click once with your mouse on the presentation you should find it advances there you go so right okay it worked fine but when we were doing it early um so we've had a a number of uh of foreign recoveries it's obviously uh, something that gets people very excited when you get a, a report of one of our birds ringed abroad or um or going abroad uh we've had a woodcock that uh, was unfortunately shot just near moscow 14 months, 15 months after, after ringing, obviously on its way back to its breeding grounds. We've had um, Phil Fair and Red Wing coming from Belgium, ringed in Belgium during the autumn and, and wintering at net. Um, we've had a, a Red Wing um, that uh, was shot in Southern France uh, the, in a subsequent winter after, after ringing at net. Um, and then reed warbler just sneaking over into Spain and willow warbler and black cap um, in France, all of those on their, on their migration south the autumn, same autumn that they were ringed. So they, those are, are, are sort of exciting and, and, and what have you, but, uh, but not really um, what we're most interested in. Um, so just looking at the UK recoveries, uh, very concentrated in the southeast uh, quarter of the country. Um, that uh, that excludes black cap, which is uh, uh, would make make a bit of a cluster themselves itself. Um, and there you go. There's there's the black cap recoveries. Um, so all of these, the, the the pink lines are showing birds going from NEP, and the blue lines are birds coming to NEP. Uh, what's perhaps most interesting is uh, is if you look at, at the birds, just the birds that are um, ringed and, and recovered in the same autumn. Um, and this shows something that we weren't really expecting in that the majority of the birds that we've had recoveries of are actually going in the wrong direction. Um, so it's not just the, the pink lines of birds heading north from net, but also the uh, the ones from the Kent and Sussex coast, 
which are moving to net. So overall, we've actually had more birds that are heading in apparently the wrong direction um, than heading in, in the right direction. But all of that's, that's quite interesting. Um, but what we're really interested in looking at is the unique nature of the NEP experiment and trying to understand the implications for the birds. So in 2015, uh, we started off ringing in um, this field uh, in the bottom left-hand corner and mainly ringing around the scrape there, thinking that uh, the water would attract birds in. Um, and this is primarily uh, willow sallow scrub around, around the scrape, um, very little in the way of thorn scrub or bramble. Uh, in 2016, we moved up to the field in, in, the, in the top right here. This is called 27 acres. Uh, this is much more mixed scrub, a lot more thorn, a lot more bramble. Um, and we focused our ringing in, in around this sort of end of the field. Um, so a little comparison between the autumn 2015 ringing in the scrub and the 2016 uh, ringing in, in the more in the thorn scrub. Um, now, the effort wasn't uniform between the two years, and so overall numbers are, are irrelevant. But what this did show was that, firstly, the, the mixed thorn scrub produced a greater diversity of species. It was much better for things like the sylvia warblers, the white throat, that's white throat, uh, black cat. Uh, and in fact, uh, and also for, for finches, um, in fact, the only species which were had a greater preference for the sallow scrub were blue tit, great tit, and long tail tit. So, um, as any ringer would understand, um, if one habitat's only better for the tits, um, you don't go back there. Um, so, since then, we've focused our attention on two fields. Uh, this is a they're outlined in green here. Um, the, the field at the top, uh, that's 27 acres, and the field at the bottom is New Barn 2. And you can see we've overlaid the, the LIDAR data on here, uh, and you can see that uh, 27 acres is a much more developed scrub. Um, it's denser, uh, it doesn't show on, the, on this image, but it's also taller. Um, whereas New Barn 2 is at a much earlier stage. So perhaps 27 acres is, is the direction of travel that we might expect other fields uh, at NEP to, uh, to progress to as time goes on. Um, this shows a, an effort corrected proportion of, of each species ringed in the two fields during a two year period where our effort was, uh, was fairly similar across the two fields. Um, and you can see that um, 27 acres, the, the more mature scrub was better for um, the tits, long tail tit, uh, also chiff chaff. Um, it was better for the thrushes um, and robin and dunnock, but the, the younger scrub, the more scattered scrub, was better for the sylvia warblers, um, better for open species such as meadow pipit, um, and also for the finches uh, and yellowhammer. Uh, we looked at it in a slightly different way, same data, but in, in a slightly different way, looking at the proportion of all birds ringed in each field um, for selected species, and that shows a very similar pattern. Um, it perhaps makes it slightly clearer that, uh, that Dunnock and, and Robin are preferring the more mature scrub. Um, but it's, it's, it's good that it's, it's showing a similar pattern. One of the other questions that we wanted to ask was, um, we, we get huge numbers of migrants uh, in the autumn in, 
at, at NEP um, and a very, very low retrap rate. So are these birds that we're catching at NEP locally bred or are they coming through from elsewhere? So we look, had a look at the phonology of the, of the captures um, to see if that showed any patterns. And here we've got at the bottom willow warbler, which is uh, either breeds very sparsely at NEP or, or doesn't breed at all, depending on the year. So you can reckon that pretty much all the birds that we're catching are coming through from elsewhere. Um, and that shows a, a sort of single peak um, in, in the abundance that we're catching. Um, a word of caution on these charts, when we were preparing them, although we've got quite good sample sizes for the number of birds caught, the sample sizes for the number of visits in any given week is very small. And we found that as we, if we tweaked how we defined a week, um, it, it did make the chart uh, change quite a lot. So um, we, we, we clearly need more data. Um, at the top, we've got black cap, um, which again shows a single peak. Um, with the overwhelming numbers that, that we catch um, in, in September in particular, I think that's hiding any, any uh, resident birds in amongst the, the swarms of, of birds from elsewhere. Um, but interestingly, for lesser white throat and white throat, it does appear to be two peaks. Um, again, as I say, major caution with interpreting this. But um, it, it, there does appear to be this, this bimodal pattern and, and uh, perhaps this shows that the early birds are the local birds. They then start to leave and are replaced by birds coming in from elsewhere. Interestingly, the peak in the third week of August for lesser white throat coincides with when peak numbers are, are recorded on the coast in Sussex. So I mentioned that we get very, very few retraps. Um, in the autumn in, in New Barn 2, we might catch 200 plus black caps in the morning. Uh, a week later, you go and catch 200 black caps in the morning and none of them are already ringed. So just to look at, at, the, at the retrap rates, um, they're out of, Virtually 3,000 black caps, we only have 33 retraps. The majority of those are within 10 days of the initial capture, uh, and then numbers decline. Obviously, the birds that uh, uh, have a long gap between the initial ringing and the recapture, they're likely to be the resident ones. Um, but this does suggest that, that perhaps the birds aren't staying at net very long, the majority of them. White throat, we've, we've actually got an identical number of, of recaptures, um, 33, but this is with less than a third of the total birds caught. So as we're getting a higher proportion of, uh, of the birds are being recaptured. Um, that's possibly because what little summer ringing we do, uh, ringing during the breeding season, we do catch more white throats uh, than, than we do black caps. Um, and obviously those birds are, are hanging around for sufficiently long that, uh, that they, um, they're more likely to be recaptured. Um, the other thing that's interesting is, is whether they're captured, whether they're moving around the fields at net and, and whether we're recapturing them between those two fields. Um, only three of the black caps were, were ever recaptured um, in, in one of the two fields, in the other of the two fields to the one they were ringed in. We also have one bird that was that moved fields um, not involving the, our two main fields. With white throat, there's just one bird that has moved from 27 acres to New Barn 2, and another three birds that were caught in different fields but not involving those two. Looking at the willow warblers, which, as I say, they, they're primarily birds or almost exclusively birds that are coming from elsewhere. We've only had two recaptures 
Um, one of those was the same day when we actually had two teams operating in adjacent fields. Um, and that, with both teams catching about 150 birds that morning, that was the only bird that was caught in the two, in, in both fields. So it, it gives a, a, an impression of, of the sheer vast numbers that, of birds that are using that. There's an awful lot of work to do though to, to really understand both the movements around the southern block and, uh, and which of these birds are, are local, what proportion are local and what proportion are birds from elsewhere. Um, Penny's mentioned the stalk bringing, um, so I won't go into in much detail here. I would point out that the person in the background is Pat, the NEP stockman. Um, I don't normally make my ringing team get quite as muddy as that. Um, but there are, there's a good reason why I, I study ground nesting passerines. Um, in fact, there's, there's two good reasons why I study ground nesting passerines. Uh, talking of which, um, they don't nest quite on the ground, just off it, but close enough. Um, Nightingale is a big focus of, of what we want to study at NET. Um, it's a site where the population is increasing, uh, bucking the trend virtually everywhere else. So that could really be one of one of three things. Either the birds at NEP are um, have a, have a higher productivity; they're producing more more fledglings each year. Um, it could be that they have a higher survival rate, but that seems pretty unlikely because I mean, two thirds of the year they're not at NEP, so it seems unlikely that where they bred would uh, would affect their uh, their survival rates or it could be that because nep has all this wonderful scrubby habitat the site is actually acting as a sink and and is drawing in uh, birds from from the surrounding countryside so we've got a long way to go really to to start to understand uh, which factors are involved. We have found some nests, um, as Penny mentioned. Unfortunately, my, my time is very limited during the breeding season and I have other projects elsewhere, so I really don't get over to find as many nightingale nests as I would like. Um, but there's certainly no particular suggestion so far that, that the nests are especially successful or have particularly large clutches. Um, in terms of whether NEP is, is acting as a sink or not, again, quite difficult to understand, but we actually got some, some data this year, which suggests the opposite, and that actually NEP is, is acting as a, a site to, to supply birds to the surrounding countryside. So we've got the blue line on the left. That is a bird that was ringed as an adult male uh, last in 2020. Um, and this year was retrapped uh, 21 kilometres away, just over the border in Surrey at Kapil. Um, the bird on the right was ringed in the autumn of, uh, of 2020. It was a young bird. Um, and it was, uh, or a ringed bird was spotted up on the edge of Gatwick Airport uh, this spring. Um, fortunately, Penny is friends with the ecologist at Gatwick Airport and managed to make arrangements to go and catch this bird, and, and it was one of ours. So that's quite interesting. Um, the, the, the adult bird is particularly surprising, though, because we know it bred successfully at NEP last year, and so it's something of a surprise that it's, uh, it's left NEP and, uh, and gone elsewhere to breed this year. Within NEP, itself uh, we're getting into interesting observations on the nightingales so this was an individual we've, we've been targeting the, the nightingales um, to try and increase the proportion of the birds that are ringed um, there was a territory at point b on the right hand side there um, and one of the team went out and she caught two birds in that territory uh, on the 20th of may she was a bit confused because neither of them had an obvious brood patch um, and so neither of them were obviously female but 
Nightingale brood patches aren't, aren't always that obvious. So I just said to her, well, all you can do is leave it unsexed. You're not sure, so you just have to leave it unsexed. Uh, all was um, became clearer the following day when she was targeting a different territory at point A, uh, 500 metres away, and she retrapped one of the birds that she uh, initially caught at point B. So this was two males. Um, the one male had moved out at just almost exactly 500 metres into its, it, her neighbouring territory um, and, uh, you know, presumably was, um, was up to no good there. Um, but it, it does show just how much the birds are moving around. You think you've got stable territories and, it, and it's something that we noticed during the nightingale surveys is that you intermittently you'll get an odd male will turn up in the middle of the breeding season somewhere completely new where you've not had them before. Um, so uh, there's, there's a lot to learn about, um, about what these things do. One other aspect of, what, of our ringing at net that's really important is the engagement side. Um, as Penny mentioned, uh, they run safaris at the site and um, when we're ringing, the safari is always welcome to come along and they do a little you know, talk and demonstration for 20 minutes or so to them. Um, sometimes we'll have two or even three safaris visit in a day. Um, and many of the people who come on these safaris are not actually the sort of people who would go on traditional guided walks and nature reserves. So we're, we're actually reaching an, uh, quite an, a novel audience. Many of them know very little about birds at all. But the, um, the feedback we get from the safari guides is that they find this really interesting. Uh, and you know, several hundred people have now have now had an experience of ringing as a result of this. We also do uh, specific demonstrations for various other groups, VIPs, that Friends of Charlie's, uh, people who've come down to, to see what's going on at NEP, um, ranging from that to, uh, to young people from deprived inner city areas who come to us with action for conservation. So that's a really important side of what we do. Um, lots of thanks, particularly to Charlie and Izzy for uh, their encouragement for what we do there. Um, my amazing team of, uh, of ringers um, uh, who supply copious amounts of chocolate and cake. Um, and uh, yeah, a particular thanks to, uh, to Josie for, for help with preparing stuff for this talk. Uh, I will just um, say thank you very much for listening and leave you with this little just fledged lesser white throat um, who uh, was probably on his maiden flight, didn't quite get it right and flew into my chest as I was walking through a field uh, just because that's the sort of thing that happens at net. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony and Penny. I'm absolutely sure that if this was actually in a real live conference, you'd have a standing ovation for that amazing picture that you've just both painted. And I think a landscape most of us would think could never really be possible uh, in Southeast England. So I think you've talked about uh, recovering soils, billowing hedges, veteran trees, uh, you know, home to the modern day version of, of Aurax um, and of, uh, of Tarpam, and of course now home to 3,000 species, I think you said, and 30 red listed birds and, you know, really incredible. Um, so thank you so much for an amazing, you know, start to our series online conferences. Slightly terrifyingly for me, there are over 40 questions in the, uh, in the chat Q&A and just so that you'd like to know that we've had, you know, 450 people listening um, to your talks, which is, you know, fantastic for us and also for NEP, of course, hopefully more people being inspired um, uh, to come and visit and buy what you're doing. So this is going to be terribly difficult for me to know um, how on earth to get through all these questions. And so I'm going to first of all apologise to people who've asked lots of fantastic questions and who really in seven minutes I can't get through them. So I'm going to start from the ones that have got lots of thumbs up for the most important ones and perhaps I'll just get you to um, not both answer all of them so we can perhaps get through them. So, so top of that list, and I'm sure it's one you've answered before, is um, from Frank. 
who asks how the estate is balancing the books? Uh, that's a very good question. And um, we are balancing the books. So where we were making a massive loss before, we are now making a profit and we are employing lots of people on the estate and um, providing jobs uh, and um, accommodation for a lot of people as well. So we have a load of different strands, uh, funding strands coming in. So we have our ecotourism through the safaris and camping business. We have our brilliant uh, meat uh, business, uh, NEP Wild Range, which is, you know, we've got a brand now, so we're able to bring more value to our own brand. And we've got our own butchery that's just opened as well. Um, we have obviously countryside stewardship. So, uh, you know, we're still farming in a way. Um, and as time goes on elms will be uh, rewarding more people for uh, taking the chance on on things like rewilding you know providing uh, benefits for you know in, in exchange for public money uh, so who got them and also some of the old barns and um, houses that were once you know part of the farm are now sort of office space uh, and we have some really nice ethical companies that are um, uh, occupying those spaces and there's about 200 people employed in those businesses that rent uh, those old dairy barns and units uh, on the estate as well so it's, it's a viable business and it might not work everywhere in the UK we are very lucky that we're quite close to London and transport links um, but you know for us we can say that, that it works really well. Thanks, that's great. And Penny, perhaps I'll ask you one more and then I'll look at a more bird question for Tony, but one that links to that um, from uh, Susan Moffat, who says, related to balancing the books, um, what needs to happen financially to encourage other landowners to do this? And someone else also asked a similar question around how can we get this to be rolled out across a, this wonderful project? I should make sure I remember that to be rolled out over a much bigger area. Um, so at the moment, there seems to be this huge interest in rewilding. Um, we run um, workshops for small scale uh, landowners and also large landowners. And we're just blown away every year by the amount of people that are coming with a view to doing some kind of rewilding or, you know, not, not the whole estate or the whole landowning, but it's happening. And we're seeing this amazing wave of rewilding projects coming on board through re Rewilding Britain that coordinate a, a wonderful network of people. So um, that's along with ELMS, the new environmental land management um, stewardship scheme, uh, we are hoping that, you know, this is going to encourage a lot more of that kind of uh, land management to go on. So take out, you know, um, marginal farmland, you know, don't bang your head against a brick wall with it, do something different and do something wonderful for nature, provide ecosystem services such as flood alleviation, recovering soils, um, you know, so, you know, uh, carbon sequestration, you know, space for pollinators, this will all be rewarded, for, hopefully, via our new elm system. I think it's a very exciting time for, for conservation in our landscape. Great, thank you very much. So, so I'll give Penny a quick break and maybe ask Tony a couple of more uh, very bird focused ones. So there's a couple here, one from Jackie who asks that your, the warblers and whitethroats seem to avoid the sallows. Um, what types of birds uh, adopt the sallows for their territories? Um, so perhaps you'd like to. <laughs> and also the other question, maybe I'll, I'll ask that in a minute. Go ask that one first. I'll ask about willow warblers then. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the answer is, is very little, actually. Um, the turtle doves uh, often nest in the in the dense sallow scrub that, that we've got at the moment, but um, the sallow is incredibly dense. There is very little light getting it through to the ground. So if you walk through, uh, it's it's really sparsely vegetated. There's no cover for anything to nest in apart from things that nest in the sallow scrub itself. So uh, yeah, it, it was very noticeable when we were doing our CBC that the, the, the blocks of sallow are really quite poor. Thanks very much. And, um, and now I need to tell you that as well as these 42 questions online, there's also questions from YouTube and Facebook coming in on a WhatsApp line for me. So it's all a bit, you know, a bit overwhelming, but I'll ask one from, um, from, the, from YouTube or Facebook. So Ben Dolan asks, if you're doing any nighttime surveys in winter to understand winter bird populations, um, uh, perhaps Tony, you might be able to comment on that. Uh, we've done a little bit with thermal imaging uh, and uh, fortunately Penny's husband works for a, an underfloor heating company and so has thermal imaging equipment, um, which has come in handy. Um, and uh, that's how we call one, one of the woodcock. Um, but generally, we've we've not found it particularly productive uh, at that site. Um, obviously, if things are roosting in the scrub, you, you wouldn't be able to catch them anyway. Um, and I don't know, perhaps the grass is a little too long 
uh, in those areas for, for things to roost on the ground. So, yeah, we, we don't find it particularly uh, productive at night, it has to be said. Thanks so much. So, so I'm going to ask, I think, just two last questions, which is really tragic. There are so many fantastic questions here. Um, but I just related this perhaps again to Penny. Susan Bennett asks, how are the relations with neighbouring farms? How do you find that? Um, so it's fairly tense at the beginning, um, as they could see um, NEP becoming quite messy and not really in, sort of, you know, uh, in an agricultural sense, you know, sort of, you know, like a productive bit of land should look. Um, but as time's gone on, things have kind of alleviated. And um, going forward, we're now part of the Upper Ada Farmer Group. And because we're not calling ourselves farmers, we're, you know, conservationists and we are producing a bit of meat. Um, I think that's taken the pressure off in one sense. And, you know, there's some wonderful farms around us that have got all sorts of, you know, ancient meadows, old trees and hedgerows, uh, important numbers of turtle doves. Again, so, you know, we're in a real hot spot where we are. So we're very much working with those farmers now. And we actually facilitate the farmer group from NEP. So it's, it's very positive. So I truly wish you could see all these floods of questions because you'd realise just how much interest there is in everything to the wildlife, the management, how we make this, you know, a role model and spread it out to much more of the countryside. So, um, so I can't quite do that. But however, um, and I've just got a message here saying that that, that someone's not sure we've ever generated as many questions for any of our online talks. So but I do want to end, and you can perhaps both answer this question with some, someone from the YouTube again, or um, YouTube or Facebook, who says, this is Tony Powell, and he says, presuming you have a farm manager at NEP, does he or she regard him or herself as a farmer, a conservationist, or a miracle worker? I wonder just what you might comment on that. Perhaps a mixture, but perhaps we both like to just comment on that before I finish. <laughs> uh, well, we have an estate manager, we have a stockman, we have a whole team of kind of conservation-minded, you know, people. And Charlie and Izzy at the top are very much, you know, conservation, wildlife, biodiversity. That's their thing now. So it's all about we're basically farming wildlife with meat as a byproduct. That's how we're looking at it. And they are miracle workers. They're they're wonderful people to work for, and I feel very very lucky that we've got these people you know flying the flag for rewilding across the UK. Fantastic thank you and I expect Tony maybe you'd like to just comment on that from the birds you've seen there I expect you might think it's more of a miracle worker too. Yeah I mean I, I think it's absolutely fantastic the, the foresight um, and the bravery of, of Charlie and Izzy to take this on in the first place and uh, and, and I would say that they're genuinely uh, interested you know it, I, it came as a bit of a shock to me uh, on one occasion going out to do, ring a red wing roost and we're there in the dark and a figure appears and it's Charlie who's come along to see what we're doing because he's actually genuinely interested so um yeah I, I think it's absolutely fantastic and uh yeah wonderful place to have the opportunity to to study and I can't help commenting that, you know, the idea of getting everyone to do a common bird census across, I think, a thousand <laughs> acres, uh, even with four visits, that's a pretty extraordinary, um, pretty extraordinary challenge. Um, so truly, I wish I could ask you more questions, um, but time is, is run out for us. And I just want to thank you both so much for a really extraordinary, you know, travel through that journey from this arable dairy landscape to now this, you know, just extraordinary wildlife oasis. And, you know, we've said before, this is about letting nature take its course, not dictating what we see in the end. So, you know, maybe we can have you back in a few years time and you can tell us about the next step in that journey, because I'm sure we'll see more uh, really exciting things. So, so thank you so much. Thank you to all of those who've listened, uh, all, you know, 400 plus people who've tuned in to hear about NEP. Um, I don't know if your visitor book's already open, but, you know, I can imagine there'll be a, a very, you know, I hope instant visit to your website and thinking about that. Um, and um, yeah, thanks to all of you that came that asked fantastic questions. So sorry we couldn't answer all of them. Um, if you've loved this, you can join us tomorrow um, for um, at seven o'clock tomorrow. We've got to talk about song, more songbirds, many that we've heard of, wheat ears, willow warblers um, and um, which is Willow Wars and Willow Tits. You can hear all about them tomorrow um, in three talks. And um, if you have enjoyed this, please do have a look at the BTO website. Think of, you know, have a look about more of the work that we support uh, and generate. Think about getting involved in the sorts of surveys you've heard Tony talk about. Um, and, um, you know, can't help but say that, of course, but, you know, the more resources we have, the more we can do for our wonderful natural world. So um, please do join us in that, that uh, you know, um, mission to do a, a better job for the world that we all love and that we've heard so much about tonight. So Tony and Penny, thank you. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, I have to say this as well, safe journey home. Thank you so much.